Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the third of our panel sessions. Uh, this one will focus on policy, and we have a, a group of five wonderful speakers. Um, they are going to be offering you their insights on where Australia has been and perhaps where Australia will be going in the future. Our first speaker, each of our speakers will have around five minutes to, to offer some initial impressions, is Mr William Fisher. Uh, he is a very distinguished retired Australian diplomat. Uh, he served uh, in a large number of Australian missions abroad, including as ambassador to France, ambassador to Thailand, ambassador to Israel, and also as high commissioner to Canada. Uh, he perhaps doesn't remember, but we in fact first met uh, when I was a high school student in southern Thailand, uh, living in Surat Thani province, uh, and the ambassador came to visit in the company of none other than Thailand's then communications minister, Suteb Tetsuban. I'm not sure uh, whether or not, uh, Bill, you recall the occasion, but for me it was, I must say, pivotal simply because I had the chance to see up close and personal uh, the activities of a serious Australian doing serious business in Southeast Asia. And uh, it made a very deep impression, so it's um, quite a pleasure to have this opportunity to introduce you this afternoon. Uh, Bill, of course, is going to be speaking to the topic of diplomacy and institutions. Next up, we have Professor Brendan Taylor. Brendan is the head of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, which is one of the components of our Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs. Uh, Brendan's Strategic and Defence Studies Centre celebrates its 50th anniversary this year, which is quite a monumental achievement. Uh, it has been a powerhouse in the study of Australian regional and global security and defence issues now for three generations and Brendan has the great task of stewarding it into its next phase. Brendan will of course be talking to us about his bread and butter which is defence and security. Next up is Dr Frank Yotso, who is the Director of the Centre for Climate Economics and Policy at the ANU's Crawford School of Public Policy. Uh, Frank and I also go back quite a ways. We were colleagues in previous positions at the ANU. And I must say, every time I hear Frank on the radio, I stop and I listen. Because if you want to hear somebody in this particular political and economic context talking about climate change and making sense, then Frank's your man. Uh, and so we're very pleased that he's been able to join us here this afternoon and, and give us some of his impressions, of course, on the very big topic of environment and development. Our fourth speaker will be Mukund Narayan Murti, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Asia Link Business, which is a very large scale cooperation between the Australian government and Australian businesses and the Asia Link operation, which is based down in Melbourne. Um, you've been in this position, I understand, now for about 18 months. Um, previously, Mukund was the director of the Asia Business Group at KPMG, a, a position which he held for five or six years. Uh, and he also, I think it's worth noting, uh, has an MBA from the Sloan School at MIT in the United States. Um, he's going to be giving us his thoughts today on the big topic of trade and finance. And then finally, we have Dr. Cecilia Jacob, uh, one of our colleagues from the Coral Bell School. She is a research fellow in our Department of International Relations. Uh, Cecilia is going to be speaking today to a topic um, about which she knows a tremendous amount, which is the role of law, uh, values and humanitarian concerns in policy debates. Uh, Cecilia has spent a great deal of time looking at these issues from the ground up, both in Southeast Asia and South Asia, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from her contribution. So uh, with those introductions getting us up to speed, I'd like to remind you that we do have a hashtag. So if you on the tweet stream, it is hashtag ANU Australia 360. Check it out. There was a fair bit of action uh, in the previous sessions, and 
I'd like to bring that forward. Let's get some momentum. Um, all of your 130 char 140 character tweets of joy. Uh, that's enough from me for the moment. I'm going to hand over the floor to William Fisher, um, who is going to speak from the lectern, uh, and we will take five or six minutes from each of our speakers before we launch into our Q&A. Over to you. Nicholas, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I have to say, I don't remember that occasion, but uh, <laughs> today uh, you actually have two ex ambassadors to Thailand and the room because Miles Cooper is here and he is uh, distinguished from me in that when he spoke to people in Thai, they understood. When I spoke to people in Thai, they just looked bewildered. And uh, so uh, I'm glad that you probably only heard me in English, which is uh, a good start. Now this is the difficult, uh, the difficult day, a difficult time slot of the day, isn't it? The first speech after lunch. So I'm just going to concentrate on being a provocative, and so I hope that your hashtags will fly. Uh, and as I only have five minutes, I'm not going to be able to cover the waterfront. You'll be relieved to hear. Uh, and so I'm going to just deal with three major issues, uh, which I think will determine how Australia fares in the years ahead. And I'm not going to go into uh, other probably equally important, perhaps, perhaps more self-contained issues like climate change, uh, terrorism, uh, preferential trade agreements, all of which of course are of major importance, but I just don't have the time. Uh, nor for that m m matter am I going to go into the unknown unknowns of a Trump presidency, um, but I will note just in passing that Australia's membership of the G20, which is a relatively new thing for us, uh, does give us a new standing in world affairs, world economic affairs, but not necessarily in world political affairs. So I just make those caveats. Okay, I think we'd probably all agree that the, the, the big underlying challenge that Australia's going to face uh, in uh, both the immediate term and the long term is how we handle the emergence of China in, in East Asia and beyond East Asia. Uh, it's increasing assertiveness and especially, of course, its relationship with the US and Japan. And all of that uh, are greatly complicated further uh, by the whole North Korea problem, which every year gets more acute and never ever any easier to respond to. Um, I'd, I'd be clear from the start, Australia, Australia cannot hope to play a definitive part in this big player, uh, titan uh, area. Titans, as I say, manoeuvre and test their relative strengths and all that Australia can do is look after its own interests and try its best not to get trampled underfoot uh, in the process. So we have an issue here of trying to balance our various relationships uh, as we go forward. Now that is not to say, not to say that we have to be equidistant. I'm not putting in a plug for equidistance between uh, the various players in the region. We have, at the end, at the beginning, an alliance relationship with the United States. It is vital to us and it has strong political support at home. No government uh, in this country can back away from it. But I suggest that that does not mean uh, either that we have to slav slavishly follow the US in all its actions and its policies. Balance, it must be said, is not Australia's forte. We have always been an aligned country, and sometimes perhaps rather mindlessly so. Throughout our history, we've uh, sought to find and follow faithfully our great and powerful friend. We're often not really much interested in making independent judgments. The decision to participate in the Iraq evasion is perhaps a classic example. I use a, a football uh, analogy to describe our foreign policy instincts so often. We choose our team and having chosen it, we pretty well faithfully follow the team leader, uh, even to the point of self-sacrifice for the team's greater good. Conservative governments, I think, uh, have tended to fall more enthusiastically into that pattern. Uh, but they're not exclusive. Uh, you can all remember Julie Gillard's uh, speech to Congress, which I think many of us thought was a bit over the top. We all knew in the bureaucracy going back uh, some years 
that in John Howard's office, the first question he ever posed when confronted with a foreign policy, policy issue was, what's Washington's view on this? And that's just a fact. By way of illustration, it's always been the case that instructions sent to our UN delegations almost invariably carry the overriding principle to vote in the company of our friends. Our friends uh, usually means, uh, almost always means, the US, UK, Canada, uh, New Zealand. Reporting back from uh, delegations in New York usually carries the same report where we and our friends have voted. It doesn't matter if we've lost or won, it's the company which was uh, important. I just contrast this in passing uh, with the approach taken, say, by France, uh, where I was posted. The French have no trouble at all in being uh, isolated. I recall one UN vote uh, when I was there where France was the only country to vote against a UN resolution. And the Quai d'Orsay took that with great pride, a matter of, uh, of national, uh, national assertiveness. Had it happened here, Canberra would have gone into meltdown. It would be completely un unthinkable for us to do, to put ourselves out in a position of uniqueness like that. Uh, sometimes we've justified our uh, uh, observance of alliance solidarity as, uh, as just uh, giving priority to alliance requirements. But often uh, that's just a case of automatically following our great and powerful leader. Howard and Abbott, for example, were happy enough to be in a voting minority of just three on Palestinian issues as long as one of those three was the United States. This new government, I have to say, uh, is, seems to be doing better. Uh, Ms. Bishop's engagement with Iran, which was contrary to US urgings, uh, is encouraging in this regard. Uh, but I guess uh, we must not forget that uh, that decision to engage Iran uh, was taken really not for foreign policy reasons, but for domestic, overriding domestic issues, in this case, finding a solution to the people smuggling problem. So, looking at how we handle East Asia, it quickly becomes, or the emerging East Asia, it quickly becomes clear that our interests will not always be identical with those of the United States, let alone with Japan's. We have an alliance relationship with the US, as I've said, a very high priority, but it cannot be allowed to trump all other aspects of our relationship with emerging China. Australian policymakers will find this hard. Instinctive echoing of Washington, as I said, it comes all too naturally, added to which is a rather regrettable tendency of prime ministers to gush uh, when they are visiting the US leading them to make decisions and even commitments which longer reflection would counsel against. Tony Abbott's approach to his meeting with Obama mentioned this morning, not what you can do for us, but what we can do for you, is a classic in the genre. Uh, this will be for us an increasing danger in, as East Asia rivalries spill over into more and more areas in the coming years. We will need to be nimble to assess where we can best place ourselves as the increasingly frequent challenges of East Asia present themselves. It's certain that the, this rivalry between uh, the three great powers of North Asia is not going to go away. And for us, clumsiness between the three powers directly involved could prove to be most disadvantageous to our interests. There will be no template for us to follow and Prime Ministers will need to keep their brains working and their traps shut from time to time, especially when overseas. Please, please, no more of Tony Abbott's best friend in Asia type of remarks from Tokyo. And Aid, speaking of Tokyo, I think we do need to be equally careful of pressures around now to adopt an over-enthusiastic embrace of Japan as a security partner. I say as a security partner, especially as concerns endorsing any Japanese security forces build up because China will react allergically to such and any future China-Japan military race is frankly out of our league. As I said, the current government seems to be doing quite well handling the various relationships with the three major powers. 
uh, is acting often, usually, in a constructive but thoughtful way. It has not sent Australian ships into China-claimed areas in the South Sea, in the South China Sea, and still maintains a principal position in support of maritime law. We did, in another manifestation of, I think, sensible decision-making, we did join the AIIB against US urging, although a cynic might say we only did so after the UK did it first. Now let's turn to another area of unique importance to Australia's future. The first is our immediate strategic neighbourhood in the South Pacific. Let's confess, we have often handled the South Pacific appallingly with, I think, incompetent diplomacy and often woeful political leadership. This has contributed to the decline of Australia's standing in the region. And again, happily, the current government seems to be doing a whole lot better than almost all of its predecessors in this regard. A low point was our handling of the Fiji coup. This is the third, the Bainimarama coup. But all of the Fiji coups we handled badly dug ourselves a hole and had finally to dig ourselves out of it. And all, always for the same reason. We applied a bullying approach to a smaller partner, insisting that Fiji come to its knees and implement reforms of our desiring, something, demands which we would never have made, for example, in regards to, say, Thailand, which has gone through many of the same issues, let alone making demands like that of Saudi Arabia. But we did so with Fiji, and I think it was out of our hubris and a total lack of realism. The result has been a hugely damaging, has been hugely damaging for Australia since Fiji, predictably enough, reacted with fury and has made it its business ever since to do whatever it can to harm Australia's interests in the Pacific. Our prime vehicle in the whole region, the Pacific Forum, is now in danger of being bypassed. Thankfully, Mrs Bishop quickly stepped in when she became minister to dig us out of our latest hole. But much of the damage was already done and it is an object lesson of how Australia's behaviour in this region is often careless uh, at best and arrogant uh, at worst. China certainly noted our self-inflicted wound here and has moved quickly to expand itself into some of the gap created. There is good news, however, from, for Australia in the South Pacific. The Ramsey development in the Solomon Islands, uh, Ramsey deployment, sorry, in the Solomon Islands uh, was enormously well done in concept, in development, uh, and in implementation. John Howard deserves great credit for it. Remember, though, that the whole enterprise was done by the PM over the head of the then Foreign Minister and his oddly uninvolved department. It took Hugh White from the ANU uh, to get the whole thing going, and he may need some time to do so again. Successive governments' lack of empathy and patience with PNG could prove a major strategic setback for Australia if we don't do better. PNG in the coming year or so will present us with serious policy challenges, its own elections and the Bougainville referendum for a start. And for years and years, our dismissiveness of Pacific Island nations' worry over climate change, our poor, our poor handling of these existential concerns on their part has crueled our standing across the region. Finally, I'm just going to turn quickly to Australia's major bilateral relationship with Indonesia. And I think by and large, we have done this well, given the difficulties. We've invested an enormous effort in Indonesia. We recognise the dangers and difficulties, and we have been, with certain exceptions, usually the ones outside government's control, we have been largely successful in keeping bilateral relations, if not smooth, then at least on track. But of course, Indonesia could turn up a surprise at any moment, even an extreme one. Uh, we all recall the extreme, extreme uh, change which Suharto's uh, sudden arrival back in the 1960s uh, posed. Our diplomatic effort in Indonesia has been, uh, we can all be proud, of a very high standard. 
and for many years we have managed, even managed a largely productive relationship with the Indonesian security agents, agencies since the Bali bombing. Who would have thought we could have achieved that? The AFP has been particularly successful. So far, so good. But this is always going to be a difficult one for us, and it's going to fling up thorny problems of all sorts. Uh, witness, for example, the recent spying uh, accusations, consular problems, animal welfare issues, and legal mini-crises. It will take all our skill to navigate through as the years progress. Thank you. is Brendan Taylor. Uh, thanks very much, Nick, for that um, uh, kind introduction. And, and thanks also, Michael, for the, the opportunity to say um, a few words. I think Australia 360 has been just one amongst a, a whole range of initiatives that you've introduced since, since taking over as director of the Bell School. In fact, creating the, the Bell School, and we've all been um, you know, very much the beneficiaries of your, your drive and your creativity and initiative on that. So thanks for the opportunity to be a part of, of this event today. Over the, the course of the, the past um, year or so, we've seen three major policy decisions in the defence and security sphere where Canberra has simultaneously managed to put each of the major powers in Australia's region offside. As some have discussed earlier today, the decision in late 2015 to lease support of Darwin to a Chinese company for a period of 99 years genu genuinely appears to have blindsided the Obama administration. Washington insider Andrew Kopernovich described the decision as a major unforced error in what has become a long-term competition with China for positional advantage, with major implications for regional stability. President Obama reportedly chided his Australian counterpart Malcolm Turnbull, noting that Washington should have given a heads up, should be given a heads up about these sorts of things. While Washington was also likely disappointed with Australia's April 2016 decision to acquire its future submarines from France rather than Japan, any such disappointment would have paled in comparison to that felt in Tokyo. As my colleague Paul Dibb wrote at the time, it is a fantasy to think that Tokyo is not deeply hurt and indeed insulted. Beijing must be rubbing its hands with glee that we are not buying submarines from its adversary, Japan. And yet China's turn to experience Canberra's cold shoulder came only a matter of months later, when in August 2016, the Turnbull government opted to block the sale of electricity distributor Ausgrid to a Chinese state-owned company on national security grounds. Commentary carried in the Chinese state-owned newspaper Xinhua following the decision characterised it as absurd and almost comical, and one with the potential to transform into a toxic mindset of Chinophobia. How and why, particularly within such a short period of time, has Canberra ended up in an enviable position of so badly upsetting our region's three major players? One possibility, of course, is that Australia's defence and security policies are a complete muddle, ineffective at best and counterproductive at worst. An alternative possibility, and one that, um, that William alluded to in his opening remarks, is that our policy approach is a good deal more sophisticated than this first interpretation suggests, reflecting what Hedley Bull famously characterised during the 1970s as Australia's interest in an equilibrium amongst all of the major powers, particularly during periods when Canberra is leaving, losing confidence in the American security guarantee, as is arguably the case again today. A third interpretation, and the one I find most compelling, is that these, these outcomes are instead a product of the fact that Australia's traditionally pragmatic approach to security and defence policy is becoming increasingly impractical in an era where major, ma major power competition is rapidly intensifying in our region. Pragmatism, as Michael Wesley observes in his work, has long been a defining feature of Australian foreign and defence policy. Decisions in these areas tend to be approached on a case-by-case -case basis. They are generally made squarely on their merits and following a careful cost-benefit analysis of the issues at hand. All indications are, for instance, that the future submarine decision was made precisely along such lines. As the well-placed commentator Petty Jennings has, has observed, the truth about the submarine program is that a careful evaluation process conducted by experienced submariners led to a sensible outcome based on delivering what the Navy actually needs. How boring is that, end of quote. 
The problem for Canberra, however, is that the major powers in our region are becoming less inclined to see defence and security choices that we make in complete isolation. Instead, as competition between them intensifies, they are each increasingly conceiving of our region as a strategic system. And they are in the process drawing more and more linkages between what their potential adversaries, and their allies for that matter, are doing in relation to one issue or part of this region, and extrapolating from this their motives and intentions across the system as a whole. Hence, when Australia leases a port to a Chinese company with links to the People's Liberation Army, that potentially leads Washington to question Canberra's commitment to defending the US-led Asian order. While there are obviously things that white papers can and can't say, the 2016 defence white paper failed to fully come to grips with this changing dynamic. So too, I would argue, did its 2009 and 2013 predecessors. The 2009 iteration recognised that strategic competition was intensifying in Asia, but did not pick up on the fact that the major powers in Australia's region were increasingly viewing this part of the world in systemic terms. In fairness, because that process hadn't really begun in earnest at the time. The 2013 Defence White Paper tried to introduce the concept of an emerging Indo-Pacific strategic system, but in my view it conceived of that system far too broadly in geographic terms and also seriously underestimated the extent to which major power strategic interactions were intensifying within it. And the 2016 version was equally guilty on both counts, coming up again with relatively comforting conclusions regarding the intensification of major power rivalry and emphasising the even more unhelpful construct of a rules-based global order, which obscures rather than illuminates the nature and geographical focus of that rivalry. The government's recently announced foreign affairs white paper process offers an opportunity to avoid and potentially address some of these shortcomings. To be sure, shaking the deeply ingrained pragmatic tradition of Australian foreign and defence policy will not be without its challenges. That said, the Foreign Minister's aspiration that we seek a philosophical framework to guide Australia's engagement, regardless of international events, seems at least a step in the right direction. Thanks very much. Brendan, our next speaker is Frank. Yeah, so uh, environment, uh, Paris, okay, Paris. Last December, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change really did make a big change as to uh, how many governments, how most governments and how boardrooms see the issue of climate change. So you had all nations of the world come together and sign up to uh, a really quite uh, very ambitious agenda uh, to address climate change uh, and to do so in a framework uh, that is arguably more politically realistic than what had gone before. Uh, and so you could take the cynical point of view and say, well, there are no binding commitments, no binding commitments that any one country has to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to any one level. Uh, but then you could equally say, well, uh, what good is a binding commitment uh, in a world uh, where, where power really rests with uh, sovereign states? And so what you have is a very strong signal that the world is coming together and that every, every country uh, will do their bit. Uh, and every country crucially includes all of the developing countries of the world. So uh, no longer can we say, well, we may have caused a mess in the rich countries, but we're not going to do anything about it um, uh, unless and until uh, the developing countries where most of the economic growth and the, the growth in resource use uh, is concentrated, unless they come on board, because they've said they'll be on board. Okay. Now, um, behind all that, of course, sits an agreement between the two, two of the major powers, the US and China. Uh, they had a joint announcement which really paved the way uh, towards Paris, um, and, and arguably that is the really big signal that each um, of the other nations have received, and that is the US and China announcing to everyone else that such is the new way of the world. And a new way of the world, if you extrapolate out a decade or two, um, is a fundamental revolution in global energy systems, right? Um, away from fossil fuels and towards clean energy sources. That's the name of the game. Um, emissions pledges that sit behind there. Uh, China has pledged to reduce the emissions intensity of their economy by 60 to 65% uh, until 2030. 
to peak their greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2030. Uh, most analysts who work in this field expect that this peaking will happen a lot earlier. United States have pledged to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28% by 2025. The same percentage numbers have been adopted by the Australian government, um, but with a timeline until 2030. Now, collectively, that falls far short of the ambition that has been spelled out in the Paris Agreement to keep global temperature rise to well below two degrees with a view to one and a half. Um, but it's certainly a lot better also than, than business as usual, which until recently we thought the world was on. Okay? Um, and the Paris Agreement provides a, a mechanism for ratcheting up national ambitions. Um, now, Australia's national target, you could probably say the same factors apply. Uh, a significant commitment, but, but not enough in light of the global ambitions. Um, Australia's greenhouse gas emissions have been flat for a very long time, for decades. And now we're saying over the next 10, 15 years, they're going to be reduced by a quarter or more. Probably more because the international community is going to expect us to do more than what's already on the table. So that means a fundamental shift um, in energy systems in particular. Australia has every opportunity to do so. Um, uh, we're really in a situation where we're better placed than most countries to make that transition to clean energy, uh, renewable energy uh, in particular. Um, our study that we co-led uh, with colleagues at ClimateWorks Australia, the Australian component to the global deep decarbonisation pathway studies shows we can do that and we can do that while maintaining prosperity. A lot of opportunity uh, in, in such a transition. And when you look at what the states are saying, you look at what... Uh, Premiers and ministers of South Australia, Victoria, the ACT, increasingly Queensland are saying, they see a lot of opportunity in this. They see investment opportunities uh, for their states. Ultimately though, however, the, the real big policy and reform agenda is at the federal level. Okay? And I think uh, it's, it's fair to say that, that the federal government has, uh, has understood this and also is beginning to implement that. Um, and we see that very directly in a, in a machinery of government change in, in bringing energy and environment together in one department uh, under Minister Frydenberg. So that's a very uh, positive sign about the, uh, the integration uh, of two policy agendas that really need to talk to each other. It also gels very, very well uh, with the governments, with the Prime Minister's innovation agenda. Right? This is ultimately um, about innovation. Um, now, Right now, this week, uh, we're expecting, uh, well, we know that these discussions are in play right now about funding for the Australian uh, Renewable Energy Agency. And so it might well be the case that we have a sort of a tacit or explicit bipartisan agreement here to slash that funding, um, which would, uh, I guess you could say, uh, go in the, in the opposite way of what, uh, what you might need in order to, uh, to foster innovation uh, in the energy, energy space. A uh, couple of things I want to mention um, before I close off. Firstly, uh, climate change finance and aid, right? Finance to developing countries. Uh, so Mr. Fisher pointed out the extreme vulnerability in the Pacific, Pacific Island states. There are very large expectations, especially by least developed countries, for financing for climate change action from the rich countries. Right? In part, this is what made the Paris Agreement possible. This will need to be reflected uh, in actions. This will need to be reflected in aid budgets. This will need to be reflected in particular in private financing uh, for climate change purposes to flow to these countries. Uh, and finally, um, I think just about every speaker has mentioned China. Uh, I will finish on, on the China note. Um, there's a really important strategic relationship here uh, on energy in particular. Right. So the traditional model has been Australian resources to be shipped to China uh, to be turned into, into products in a very traditionally uh, energy intensive and resource intensive way. Uh, the new way, if we do end up in the, in the global low carbon economy, um, can very easily also have a very strong Australia-China trade component to it. Trade in clean energy to go from Australia to China. Um, and flows of knowledge and innovation um, from Australia to China. So we saw that, in fact, in the context of the now abolished um, 
policies around carbon pricing and other climate change relevant policies. There has been very strong interest in China as to how we do things in Australia, how we, uh, how we design the policy settings around that, uh, how we affect market reform uh, to get to new settings that facilitate this new type of cleaner economy. Uh, and that is something that we can certainly build on uh, in that bilateral relationship with China. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Frank. Round of applause for Frank. <laughs> Next up is Mukut. Thank Over you, to you. And thanks, Michael, as well, for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. So as Nicholas mentioned, my name is Mukut Narayanamurthy, and I'm the CEO of AsiaLink Business, which is the National Center for Asia Capability. We were established by the Federal Department of Industry, Innovation, and Science to help create an Asia-capable workforce in Australia. So I thought I'd make um, three key comments to contextualize why our trade and finance relationship with Asia is so important, and then make three key observations as a result of that context. First, between now and 2030, Asia is projected to account for about $67 trillion of GDP, which will be greater than all of the countries in the Americas and Europe combined. Second, between now and 2030, Asia is expected to account for about 70% of global capital stock, which means that countries like Australia will only grow increasingly reliant for both foreign direct investment and also portfolio flows into this country from Asia. And third, even sooner, by 2022, the middle classes of Asia will outnumber the middle classes of the rest of the world at about 3.2 billion. So Australia is strategically really well positioned to cater to the private consumption needs of the consuming classes in Asia, which will vary by sector. So having said that, I'll make three key points about our trade and finance relationship with the region. First, our trade relationship is strong. Six out of 10 of our top 10 trading partners are in the region. However, that relationship has been heavily concentrated in mining, in resources, in the agricultural sector, and in international education and tourism. When I last looked at ABS data for 2014-15, of 2.1 million registered businesses in Australia, only 45,000 traded internationally. And of that 45,000, 338 made up 85% of all international trade. That's 0.00016%. That's how far we are from 1% to be even statistically relevant, and yet we like to overstate the relevance of our export relationship with the world, not just Asia. So while our trade relationships at one level appear to be strong, they are very narrow by sector and highly concentrated in terms of the types and number of organizations that lead our export relationships of the world. When we think of that, our economy is predominantly a services-driven economy when you look at data that's cut on a trade in value-added approach. Three quarters of our economic performance comes from the services sector. Nine out of 10 jobs are in the services sector. And our economic modeling at AsiaLink Business has highlighted that between now and 2030, if we can broaden our engagement with the region, we could add a further million jobs just in our services sector, meeting the private consumption needs of Asia. Which leads to my second point. For us to go from a strong trade relationship, and if we're coming off the commodities boom potentially, and we do need to rebase to a much broader services type relationship with the region across healthcare and aged care, professional services, the creative industries, financial services, so that it's not just iron ore and coal and international student recruitment, then we have to be willing to invest in the region. And here, which is my second point, our investment relationship with the region is extremely poor. There is very sketchy foreign direct investment data of Australian businesses investing across countries in the region. But what we do know, for instance, from some research that's been undertaken, for example, by PwC approximately two years ago, is that only 9% of Australian businesses are currently investing in the region. Only 12% have any history of having invested in the region. 65% or two-thirds of all Australian executives have no interest whatsoever of changing their position, which is not to invest in the region. 23% of large businesses choose to fly in and fly out of the region, even where they do have some sort of business, rather than establish a presence on the ground. 
And the reason given by our very rational managers that run, in particular, our large businesses because of the pressures from their boards and their large institutional investors is that Asia accounts approximately for only about 12% of the bottom line of their businesses. So in their short tenures and the pressures that they have from their boards and the institutional investors, they don't believe that the long-term orientation that Asia demands for a business to be successful, to be worth their time, because they'll never see the fruits of that success. So there's this cycle that's playing itself out in Australia where management looks at boards and says, you're not going to give us the leeway to invest in the long term. Boards say, well, we'd love to, but we need to ensure that you're compliant with the needs of the Corporations Act and the demands of our institutional investors. And our super funds are so powerful in this country say, well, that's all wonderful, but um, mums and dads actually want quarterly returns can't really see you investing into Asia and providing the returns in a time frame that's actually going to work for our investors. So this isn't just someone else's problem. This is our problem because we're all holders of a stake in superannuation funds in one way or another. So we all have to change our preferences for return for there to be a cascading impact on boards and then management teams. My third point is that notwithstanding the Oscrate process recently, which has been touched on, our inbound investment relationships with the region have actually been quite good. If you look at the Japanese, it's often forgotten that Mitsui has been in this country since 1901. Mitsui has, ha has had, for instance, a longer presence in this country than many of our ASX 100 businesses. Mitsubishi entered this country in 1956. The South Korean conglomerates and their state-owned enterprises like Korea Resources Corporation, Korea Gas, and then their big um, entities like POSCO, Hyundai, and others, many of them have had a presence here for about 40 years. And some of them have up to 30 to 35 separate investments across a range of sectors. The Indians have been investing here as well over the last 15 years quite aggressively. To some extent, heavily focused on the mining sector, for example, and coal assets in Queensland, but there are approximately 30 Indian information technology businesses with the likes of IBM and Accenture that are absolutely dominating the IT outsourcing market in this country. And then you've obviously got the Chinese who are very strong, not just with the state-owned enterprises, but we're also seeing a significant amount of listed entity investments from Hong Kong across a range of sectors in financial services, and you're also seeing it now in health and well-being and in wellness businesses as well. For example, Swiss was acquired recently by Biostime, and we've got two other very large um, vitamin-related businesses which are going through sale processes which have been in the media recently where bidders are also from China. So Chinese investments in this country are not just in sensitive areas like energy and mining and electricity and distribution assets, but are extremely diversified, which is often not picked up. And the final point I want to make on the inbound investment relationship as well is that in any given year, especially if you look at the last three-year average, FERB looks at approximately 100,000 applications. Only about 64 applications, I believe, last year were rejected. Again, that is less than 0.01% of all applications to FERB. So when you look at the history of Japanese investment in this country, Korean investments in this country, Indian investments in this country, and Chinese investments in this country, this country is actually quite open and welcoming, and compared to a lot of other countries in the world, is actually a really good place to do business. So I just thought I'd paint that picture. That is actually not a popular view to paint, particularly the last point, but the data when you actually look across a long period of time and actually work day in and day out with businesses, many of them are actually quite happy with the experience of doing business here. Might just stop. Thank you, we could round of applause. This is an opportune moment to remind you that we have a hashtag. It is hashtag ANU Australia 360. Uh, some of you are lighting it up. Um, I think you'll like this, Mukund. It says here, wow, talk about putting us back in our place. Um, and it goes on. Anyway, I'll leave you all to digest the uh, insights from the tweet stream. It's now over to Cecilia. Thanks a lot, Nick. And um, I'd like to echo uh, what Brendan also said. Thanks to Michael Wesley for organising this forum. 
It's been very informative and very interesting, and I have the pleasure of rounding off this uh, very fascinating panel with a quite a different take on Australia's contribution. Uh, and I'm looking at laws, values, and humanitarian concerns. Uh, so I guess what I wanted to do was just step back a little bit up to the international level and come back down to the regional and local because I think Australia is positioned very uniquely in the world in terms of our reputation, in terms of our ability to um, punch above our weight, uh, in terms of influencing international norms and values and particularly in the area of human protection. So a lot of what I look at is uh, in the area of protection of civilians and atrocity preventions. And Australia has been very innovative and very influential in this space. Um, I do think that it's a shame that the debate, the domestic debate in Australia, has been very narrowed in the space of Australia's humanitarian assistance policy and that it focuses very much on Australia's um, offshore detention, which we touched on earlier this morning, which, yes, is a blight on our uh, reputation for humanitarian assistance. So I'm not going to dwell on that because it has been touched on, but rather to step back and look at other areas of uh, Australia's influence I thought would help kind of open up this discussion and this debate. So Australia is one of the world's most generous contributors to humanitarian assistance. We currently rank 17 in the world in terms of our um, humanitarian aid giving. This is a decline. We were previously at um, ninth in the world, I think it was 2009, down to uh, 13th in 2013, so we're down to number 17. Um, but in terms of the kind of context that we're working in, we're also in a global context where there is a significant fragmentation of the international humanitarian system and international humanitarian order. Uh, in terms of many of the shifts, I'll have a look at the, the broader international context, but in terms of challenges to international law, the changing character of armed conflict, the internalization of conflict, most conflicts around the world are internalized, have uh, challenged the laws of war. International humanitarian law was designed um, uh, in the wake of uh, the First World War in terms of the Geneva Declaration, but um, codified post-World uh, War II and updated in the late 1970s uh, in, in response to uh, a different international order than we're in today. And so much of the discussion and the debate around humani surrounding humanitarianism is how um, relevant the current laws of war are for responding to today's conflicts. Uh, and uh, the implementation of human rights within spaces as well. So in thinking about Australia's contribution to humanitarianism, there's two ways that we can think about it. We can think about Australia's contribution in terms of advocacy and changing the landscape of um, the, the principled debates and values. And then there's also the material contribution in terms of financial um, personnel and um, material um, in terms of response, particularly to disaster relief. So the context internationally, the international humanitarian uh, system is under enormous strain. So there's currently 50 state-based armed conflicts going on around the world today. There's 70 non-state um, armed conflicts taking place around the world. Fortunately, our region has seen a significant decline in the number of conflicts. We haven't had any uh, major international or interstate conflicts in our region since the end of the Cold War. Uh, we do have ongoing internal conflicts in southern Philippines, southern Thailand, uh, uh, parts of Myanmar. Uh, we are seeing a rise in sectarian violence in our region in uh, South Asia and um, parts of Myanmar as well, which is quite concerning. But the international um, spectrum is, is quite vast. The impact of natural disasters also is significant. So in 2015, a report by the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific estimates that over the past decade, the Asia-Pacific region experienced over 1,600 natural disasters, which represents 40% of the global total. In just our region, this affected 1.4 billion people and cost the lives of over half a million people, which represents 80% of the world's population affected by natural disasters. So a disproportionate impact um, in terms of the humanitarian effect of natural disasters. Uh, in terms of uh, global trends, there's 125 million people who are in need of humanitarian assistance, according to the United Nations. Uh, and this number has actually doubled in the past decade. Um, 
So this is driven by major conflicts that have broken out in other you know, parts of the world over the past few years. So Syria, Iraq, South Sudan, Libya, Yemen are examples of major conflicts that have escalated over the past few years. Um, major crises that also have regional implications and has also drawn Australia um, into these responses. In terms of stateless persons, um, there's an estimated 65.3 million forcibly displaced people worldwide, which is the highest number on record since the end of the Second World War. So we are living in a very um, historically unprecedented situation in terms of um, the level of the crisis and um, the nature of the conflicts. And in looking at those figures, um, the UN coordinated appeals for humanitarian assistance for funding in 2016 have only been uh, met by, uh, only 33% of the contributions have been given so far. So two thirds of the funding for UN um, coordinated appeals for humanitarian crises remain unfunded. So what we're seeing is even where there's an increase in funding for humanitarian assistance, the scale and the rate of increase of the humanitarian crises, um, the international community is not keeping pace with it. Uh, politically, there's still a high level of inconsistency and selectivity in international political responses. So still um, a lot of political uh, infighting and disagreements at the highest levels of decision making around the world. Now, Australia's performance in this area is um, quite unique, and I wanted to look back at Australia's role in the UN Security Council in 2013 and 2014, just to put, my fin uh, to put a finger on some of the contributions that Australia made in, during this period that I think are lesser well known. So as the debate has contracted around humanitarian assistance in Australia, um, some of the um, contributions that Australia made in drafting UN Security Council resolutions, um, leading the negotiations and seeing the implementation of many first-time uh, UN Security Council resolutions around protection of civilians and humanitarian access gives us insight into the kinds of values that Australia has been able to project to the international system and also the reputational benefits that Australia has gained from which they're leveraging at the moment within that space. So through their work, they were able to secure more robust mandates for a series of um, peacekeeping operations in Africa. They were able to push through a political deadlock in the UN Security Council um, to open up um, by passing two UN Security Council resolutions on which they worked, uh, opening up humanitarian assistance and access into Syria without government consent, a first of its kind in the space of protection of civilians. They brought North Korea, the situation in North Korea, onto the agenda of the UN Security Council for the first time by drawing international attention to the human rights situation. Um, they led the Security Council in managing the transition uh, in Afghanistan from the combat-led mission to the um, Afghan security control. They authored and led the negotiations on UN Security Council Resolution 2166 that allowed for access to the crash site of uh, MH17 in Ukraine. Again, the first of its kind and the only UN Security Council resolution since uh, in Ukraine. Uh, author uh, and then other areas where they contributed um, were on authoring and leading uh, resolutions in terms of countering terrorist violence, um, recognising the significance of policing and peacekeeping operations to make sure that that's more consistent and mainstream, and stemming the flow of small arms and illicit weapons. In terms of advocacy, Australia has also been one of the leading international advocates on the responsibility to protect doctrine. We know that um, our former Foreign Minister, Gareth Evans, was uh, uh, one of the co-authors of the original 2001 report on responsibility to protect. Uh, former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd played an important part lobbying for the application of R2P um, uh, when the UN sanctioned intervention into Libya in 2011. So given this history and Australia's role, um, Australia continues to use its reputation by undertaking a lot of informal advocacy work in the UN, both in New York and Geneva. So they've been rallying um, many like-minded middle power states, states from the global south, um, advocacy, but also um, raising awareness uh, among the, the member states to not only promote these norms and to call for greater coherence, accountability, um, and consistency in the way that they're applied, but to put conceptual underpinnings around them by creating a lot of information and capacity building forums um, at, within the UN. 
So they've been leveraging off these reputational gains that they made through strong leadership on the UN Security Council and um, has been taking this forward into their bid for a seat uh, on the UN Human Rights Council in uh, 2018 to 2020. Um, so I'm getting the, the time up. So in terms of an overall assessment, um, I would say that Australia has made a lot of significant contributions that need to be um, opened up into the international debate. Um, we are being watched by countries in the region. So while we do have a lot of challenges, and a lot of them have already been spoken about, so I won't go over them within the region, our um, aid budget did drop by a billion, again, in the 2015 to 2016 budget. Our, our contributions to, humani to um, ODA is at the lowest. It has been, um, it's dropped down to 0.22%, um, which is an all-time low, coming at a time when international um, needs for funding is at an all-time high. So a lot of um, challenges ahead, and I think just echoing in closing, um, many of the comments today surrounding um, uncertainty in the security and the defence space um, and the regional trends is to also consider Australia's need to articulate a clear vision for its humanitarian um, of operations and contributions around the world. They've obviously had a clear contribution in this space. Um, our reputational gains can be undermined by some of our um, more localised um, responses to asylum seekers and um, even to our Indigenous populations. So I think it's important that we be um, articulate about how we carry these forward. We've now got 14 minutes for questions. Um, what I propose that we do is that we take a big batch of questions and we just pepper our panellists with them. Our, our panellists will be encouraged to keep all of their responses very brief um, so that we can get uh, as many different people having their say as possible. And we're going to start right down here at the front. Thank you very much, Ashley, for running the microphone in. Reminder again, hashtag ANU Australia 360 if you're not on it already. Thank you. Thanks, my name is Alex. Um, I had a question for Cecilia, which you touched on very briefly in your closing remarks, um, which is the current climate regarding policies around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We will take that and we will get the microphone, hopefully, over the back to retired ambassador to Thailand, Miles Cooper. So, uh, Miles, over to you. Thank you, and thanks to uh, Bill Fisher as well for the acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to direct this question to Bill. Uh, it relates to uh, diplomacy and institutions, notably our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. A uh, major step in the evolution of that department has been the merger with AusAid. Uh, do you have a sense, Bill, of how that's affected the effectiveness of our aid program? and how it's affected the overall effectiveness of the department. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Alex. So, we, so, Miles, so we've got Alex's question queued up. We've got Miles's question. We're going to dash back over here for one more, please, Ashley. Thank you very much. Uh, Terry Henderson. Um, uh, um, aid structures are changing in many countries in the world, particularly in some parts of Asia. For instance, in Japan, on the extreme, with no immigration or virtually none, the, uh, age, the great majority of the population is going to be over 65, not very far in the future. Australia is aging, but not as rapidly because it allows immigration. Now, and China is getting demographic problems and other countries. Do you see any opportunities for Australia to take advantage of the aging rapid aging of Asian populations in the country where it's, countries where it's occurring. Okay, and if there's one more, I'd love to take it right now. So we've got a neat foursome. Yes, thank you, in the front here. Thanks. Um, hi, uh, my name is Megan. I just actually um, had a quick question for Cecilia, but perhaps also Mukund and um, Bill. Uh, given global sort of anti-Islamic sentiment and the recent Burkini ban in France, uh, what do you think of the implications for Australia's trade and relationships with um, Muslim Southeast Asian countries such as Indonesia, 
uh, Malaysia and Brunei. Wonderful. Let's start with these. Cecilia, over to you. Okay. Um, thanks for picking up on that. Yeah, it's interesting for, we can put our finger and there's a whole lot of other statistics. I didn't talk about Australia being, you know, one of the most generous countries in the world of intakes of, you know, resettling asylum seekers and so on. That for all that we do contribute to, um, what's looked at in terms of our contribution is often the negative side of, of things, you know, how we treat asylum seekers. And I think one of these areas, um, again, comes down to um, structural discrimination and cultural attitudes towards our own Indigenous populations. Um, and I think that this, um, you know, the recent, um, you know, uh, expose of the, the treatment of youth in detention centres is one uh, illustration of how um, our reputation, you know, you can work very, very hard to build a good reputation and very quickly the leverage that you've just won can be underwritten by poor domestic um, choices and practices. And I think that we do need um, smart leadership on how we deal with these key issues because externally this is what our countries in our region are looking at and it puts us in a very poor position to be able to comment on the contracting human rights space in you know, countries around our region when uh, we struggle to get our act together in these. Um, or maybe I'll leave the... We'll come back to that. Yeah. Bill. Miles's question, perhaps first. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Miles. I was just thinking about uh, that. I thought about it a lot because I'm, uh, I was involved in it from the, the start. I mean, the main change that's occurred, uh, apart from the actual integration, is the reduction. So uh, AusAid, in its last year, was geared up uh, optimistically for an $8 billion program, and that was cut uh, sort of overnight to a $5 billion program. <clears throat> so that was a, a huge change. And um, the second part of that change was to uh, concentrate the remaining $5 billion into particular areas, into uh, uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. So the, the effect of the cut was greatly felt on those areas which were cut. So Africa, uh, other bits of Asia, Southwest Asia, and the multilateral uh, organizations. So the, the effect of the cut was uh, you know, very geographically uh, targeted, if you like. So that was, that's, I guess, point one. Um, point two is that um, uh, the, I think, to be brutally frank, um, the old AusAid had uh, um, over-invested in what it felt it needed to deliver eight billion dollars and frankly some of its overinvestment was uh, was quite unrealistic so that doubled the impact of the cut when cuts were made um, and that had a big effect of course on the staff involved because people who were employed often at very great salaries uh, to do a job which was going to happen but, but which then never happened uh, really magnified the problem so <clears throat> so coming on to the effect on uh, the building across the road here, or now several buildings, uh, it, uh, it has certainly been an enormous revolution because Australia has chosen a pattern of integration between the old foreign affairs and the old AusAid, a pattern of total integration. Now, many countries have integrated their aid programs into their foreign policy, all the Scandinavians, uh, the Netherlands, Canada, Canada off and on, I must say, uh, New Zealand sort of off and on a bit too. Uh, and often their integration has just been to sort of move the two sides into vague proximity and let them function as before. That's certainly the Canadian model, just to, to leave, sort of bring them closer and call them integrated, but in fact they're not actually mixed. Whereas here in Australia, we, we did what we did with the trade integration back in 1987, which was to entirely uh, throw the, the two lots of people together and churn them up. So uh, you now have uh, this transitory situation where people are employed doing things they really do not have a big background for. And that's, that has been a, had an impact on, uh, on competence and has had an impact, I think, on the broadening of perspectives. But I think the main point which I'd want to make in all of this is that uh, I firmly believe, and this is the government's view too, that aid is part of foreign policy. 
Now, that is a very controversial view. Uh, the old AusAid did not operate on that uh, assumption. It operated on the assumption that aid was done for the good of the people getting the aid. And that's the DFID model, which is the UK model, and that is the model which we have rejected. Uh, our view, and the, um, certainly my view, and certainly the, the view of uh, Julie Bishop in putting this exercise forward, was that aid delivery should be and should be seen as and should be delivered as part of foreign policy, and that has been an enormous revolution. So we'll have Terry's question. Okay, I'm happy to respond to Terry. So, Terry, I see two dynamics at play in Asia, if I were to generalize. One is the aging population issue, which you mentioned. So in a place like Japan, the way in which Australia is involved with what's happening in Japan, aging population, um, stagnant growth agenda, negative interest rates. So you're actually seeing a lot of those Japanese trading houses and businesses investing overseas. And we're seen as an attractive place for them to actually invest and do business. We're not necessarily directly addressing the aging population issues as far as I can see. But we are doing that in some other markets in the region. For example, in parts of China, in Malaysia, Australian uh, healthcare and aged care providers in particular are setting up quite significant centers where they're seeing opportunities where there is less and less stigma that's attached to elders being in retirement homes and aged care facilities rather than with their children. They're trying to find ways in which to re reduce that stigma and enable that transition to happen. But on the other hand, in addition to this dynamic of aging populations, you've also got places like India that have a demographic dividend. As David Bloom would call it, a median age population of about 25. And the big opportunity there that Australia is looking to seize is around um, education, and not just around international student recruitment, but really looking at the vocational education opportunity, where by 2022, the Indian government is looking to scale up 500 million Indians across 22 sectors, and that is the single biggest opportunity actually for Australia with India. And so Australia is very focused on that. So it's healthcare and aged care on the side of the aging populations in those markets where there's an issue, not necessarily with Japan, but in some other markets, and then you've got education with India. And our final question uh, that was all about um, our interactions with our Muslim neighbors. Um, if you'd like to have a first go at that. Back to you. Um, so you asked the question as well in the context of our um, trade and investment relationships, if, if I recall correctly. So I actually don't see the fact that there are Muslim countries as, as the issue. Um, when I speak to people from Indonesia, they actually make the point to me that they don't see themselves actually as a Muslim country. And they actually don't like the fact that Australia looks at Indonesia as a Muslim country, which is actually quite startling because we think that that fact as being Indonesia 101. And yet we get that wrong because the Indonesians don't see themselves as a Muslim country. They're quick to point out that they have a Catholic population of something like 15 to 20%. So they're quick to make that point. India, on the other hand, don't like being called a Hindu nation because they've got 150 Muslims in the country. It doesn't affect our trade with that part of the world. So second most populous of Muslim country in the world. So I actually see other issues. I see language proficiency issues, which is a big issue for us in engaging with the region. And on that um, record, our performance is getting worse uh, by the day across Asian languages. Uh, I see the issue of cross-cultural competency for business executives uh, and those in, uh, in diplomatic circles. So if you haven't picked up an Asian language, for instance, when you're in school, um, or early enough, then um, it might be beyond time poor executives, but becoming cross-culturally competent, being self-aware, mindful, picking up the skills to be able to relate to different cultures in diff when you're put in that position of having to engage with them is definitely attainable. Having the capacity to deal with government. A lot of the countries in the region are not market-driven economies. Really understanding the role of government and how to work effectively with government is another major issue. So I don't see the whole uh, the Muslim-Islam uh, dynamic as the core issue that's affecting our trade and investment relationships, I see a whole range of other individual and organizational capabilities that are actually impeding our ability to engage effectively. Great. Well, we are almost out of time. I would love any final reflections, perhaps. I can just um, 
perhaps Bill, add two, two words uh, to that. Uh, I don't really think there's a, a great uh, flow on to, for Australian interests from the, uh, the events in France uh, because the, the, the cultural dissimilarities are, are very great, really, between Australia and France. France is an assimilationist country. Anybody can be French, but you must become absolutely French. Uh, in Australia, we have a policy of multiculturalism. You bring your culture with you. And uh, so uh, th things like bikini bands here would be, in fact, we invented the bikini. Someone here did, uh, not me. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we are, we are not in that position of, uh, of trying to, uh, to enforce a cultural identity. And the French are very much in that, uh, in that framework. So I don't think there's any particular um, flow on for us from the French situation. Any final comments from, from Brendan or Frank? Uh, well, yes, Frank. You know, since you ask, um, <laughs> I would mention the, the Australia-China Joint Economic Report that was released last week or the week before, right? So Peter Drysdale, the of Crawford School in charge, and you know, they're just making the argument that we well know, but that we forget sometimes, that we need to engage, right? And there's every opportunity for Australia to engage in the region. And it's that imperative, you mentioned Indonesia before, and China is the other obvious place, and many, many other bilateral relationships that really need looking after, and, and it'll be uh, in, enormously fruitful for, for Australia to, to engage deeply. Great, thanks very much. Please join me once again in thanking Cecilia, Mukun, Frank, Brendan, and Bill.